Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing show. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. If you're enjoying the show, do me one quick favor and leave us that five-star rating and review. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, today we're going to be talking to Ross Kimbarvsky. Ross Kimbarvsky is the founder and CEO at CrowdSpring, where more than 220,000 experienced freelancers help agencies, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and nonprofits with high-quality custom logo design, web design, graphic design, product design, and company naming services. CrowdSpring has worked with the world's best brands, including Amazon, LG, Starbucks, Microsoft, Barilla, Phillips, and so many more. And he's also worked with the world's best agencies, not to mention tens of thousands of entrepreneurs, startups, and nonprofits. Let's welcome to the show, Ross Kimbarski. Thanks so much, John. Happy to be here talking with you and uh, your listeners. Absolutely. Ross, I know I said your last name. I want to make sure I get it 100% right. Can you say it for me one last time? Kim Barofsky. It's common pronunciation. Kim Barofsky. Kim Barofsky. All right. Sorry about that. Well, Ross, That's why right. don't you take a minute or two and just give us a little bit more context on what you do and, and what led you to found CrowdSpring. So uh, I was an attorney for the first 13 years of uh, my career. I started practicing in 95 when the internet became commercialized, working with entrepreneurs and startups. And also my, my main focus was intellectual property and complex commercial litigation. I was a trial lawyer. And like a lot of entrepreneurs, I ran into a problem trying to solve uh, something in my business. I was a partner at a mid-sized firm and I was leading the redesign of my firm's website. So I did what a lot of mid-sized firms do. Um, I put together uh, our requirements. I interviewed agencies. I picked the one that I thought was the best. I gave them a lot of money. And two months later, they came back with designs and I hated all of them. And I was frustrated as a consumer of these services, uh, as a business owner, because uh, it, it seemed like it was an awkward way to buy design services. We needed to up our design game. That wasn't doing it for us. And so uh, this is in 2006. I went home and I did what I normally did when I ran into a problem. I just started researching and ultimately developed this idea. Why couldn't we have designers around the world compete for design, as opposed to the normal process where you look at portfolios and look at bids, pick somebody and then wait weeks or months for them to produce designs. And that idea, after a lot of research, turned into CrowdSpring, which today, as you mentioned, 220,000 designers around the world, helping businesses and, and agencies and nonprofits with everything from custom logo design to web design, signs and everything in between. And the difference is we cut prices 10 to 50 times less than the market. So uh, logo projects start at $299, including all fees. And to solve the problem I ran into, which is you hire somebody and then wait, rather than giving you bids and proposals, designers on CrowdSpring participate and give you actual designs to your specifications. So you're picking from 60, 70 different logos for your business. You pick the one you want, um, and we give you a free legal contract, and we protect all that with a, with a money-back guarantee. Man, that's awesome, right? I mean, listening to kind of your story and solving your own problem. And it's always fun listening and talking to entrepreneurs, right? Because a lot of times these businesses are born out of a problem that that individuals are facing. And in this case, you know, it comes from trying to get better creative. And I spent about 15 years in, in the marketing and advertising world. So I completely understand the frustration of, you know, working with an agency, getting some work done, and maybe not being satisfied with the, the results right? And having to go back and forth and just that entire process. So talk to me a little bit more about kind of as you look at the opportunities, because there's big marketing agencies that certainly cost a lot of money. And unfortunately, most entrepreneurs just don't have the budget to go hire one of those guys. So to, to work with a firm like yours uh, provides more of a, a financial benefit because the, the cost is much less than hiring a full service agency. 
But more importantly, it's really about the work you're getting. And it sounds like you've created a model where you're able to actually focus on the designs and selecting the designs versus just hiring somebody and hoping that they do a great job. Well, that's the beauty of our model. First of all, it works for smaller businesses. So whether you're a business with one employee, a solo entrepreneur, or 10 employees, but it also works for multinational companies. A lot of our clients, you mentioned up front, are, are big businesses and agencies. And the reason agencies are our clients, agencies are really great at strategy. Um, they can create strategy around your brand identity, your visual design. They can help you with marketing strategy. Um, these are skills that are really tough and people who learn them and practice them and continue to educate themselves, stay focused in that business. What they historically haven't been phenomenally great at is execution of, of design collateral. So they've outsourced that historically. And the problem is that, that in the past, they struggled, agencies struggled with, with outsourcing that work too, because they also didn't know what to expect. They also didn't have a lot of choice and it wasn't inexpensive for them too. So as a result, clients like my law firm and, and people who listen to your show, when they go to an agency to ask for a brand identity, a new logo, new website, you know, new color scheme, they get quotes like $25,000 or $50,000. And listen, there are lots of great agencies. They do phenomenal work and probably worth that money to a business that's established, that's making a good revenue, that's looking to take the next step. But as you said, the reality for most smaller businesses, even if they want it, they can't afford it. And so there has to be a better solution than what we used to do for hundreds or thousands of years, which is find a freelancer and then wait for weeks or months and hope that the one logo they're going to produce for us or the one website design they're going to produce for us will be great and we'll love it. And the reality is that as consumers, most of us don't love everything that we see. And this is why CrowdSpring was born, to give you choice, to give you the ability to buy for $299, something that you would otherwise have spent $10,000. Um, and it, it levels the playing field because it lets designers around the world, um, without regard to their color, culture, language, compete on a playing field where just their talent matters. Yeah, I love that, man. I think you you nailed it, right? And I mean... I've been on both sides of that as well. I was on a client side. I was on the agency side. And there's nothing more frustrating than feeling like you just, you're missing the communication, right? And sometimes it's really hard for clients to convey specifically what they want, right? Or why something doesn't work. And it's really hard to get into that. So if you have a, a broader spectrum of options, it can be a little easier to say, hey, that's close. That's what I want. Or, hey, this is really close, but I need a couple edits here. Um, so that I think that just model makes a lot of sense in allowing people to really take advantage of technology and kind of the, the gig economy in a way where we just have access to so many more creatives. So as opposed to hoping that one creative nails it with what it is you're looking for, you now have a wide variety of people and creative options to select from. You know, I want to I want to broaden this conversation out a little bit, right? Because as we're getting into it and the value of having a lot of freelancers and how this is valuable for, you know, smaller businesses as well as larger companies, I think we need to talk about just the importance of branding as a whole because we're talking about, you know, collateral, whether it be a website or logos and things like that. And some people listening to this may say, to whatever, just slap slap a logo on there. I got this thing from this, you know, from a Vista print or, you know, you have the old clip art that people used to use. And, uh, you know, they, they, they just put that on there and go talk to me about branding and why it's actually important to make sure that you do have kind of quality imagery and logos and branding to help represent your company. So, uh, my perspective and our perspective as a company around design and branding is going to differ quite a bit from most agencies. Most agencies are going to tell you that as long as you have phenomenal branding, invest tens of thousands of dollars, get great branding will, will help propel your business to the next level, will help you increase revenue. And look, that's true in part. Good design is good business. A good visual identity for your business creates credibility. But you have to look at it holistically, and this is where we differ with a lot of agencies that talk about this topic. You have to invest in design as much thought, not saying as much money, 
but as much thought as you invest in the product or service that you create. So if you have a great product or a great service, if you have a real estate investment that you're syndicating and you have phenomenal properties and you have great uh, limited partners, all of that works really well if the rest of your visual image is consistent and strong. But if you go to new investors and your logo looks like clip art or like hundreds of other real estate investment businesses, they're going to lose quite a lot of trust in what you have to offer. And you're going to lose quite a lot of credibility because you won't stand out. So to us, the design part has to be equal at least in thinking, to the rest of the business that you're building. Because the way we measure, the way people measure each other, the way they evaluate credibility, the way they evaluate the credibility of businesses is, is really quick snap judgment. So just as an example, people process images 60,000 times faster than they process words, uh, which means that when you see somebody and you're meeting them for the first time, before either one of you opens your mouth to say a single word, each of you will have made some judgment calls about the other person. If somebody sees your logo, if somebody sees your business card, if somebody looks at your clothing, if somebody sees you in a car, they're going to make judgments about that. And so those judgments tend to stick. So there's something called an anchoring effect, which, which, which is an effect that, that creates this anchor. The first thing you hear or think is, is the thing that you tend to gravitate to. So if you give a poor impression to somebody because you have a clip art identity, your website looks like a generic site that every other real estate investment business has, they're not going to look at you in any special way. And they're going to second guess the products and the opportunities that you bring to them. On the other hand, if what you give them is something unique, then that will simply reinforce and support the unique opportunities, the unique investments, the unique structures that you put together. So it's got to be holistic. You can't just focus on one without the other. Yeah, I love that breakdown. And you said something that's so poignant about, you know, people processing images 60,000 times faster than the words. So our first impressions, you know, we say first impressions count. Well, it's also about how you show up. You know, you're talking about the what you see in front of you. It's the logos, it's the clothing, it's all of those things. And many of us may not take those things um, as serious, but it, it makes an impression. And then once, you know, that impression is made, we now are fighting against that anchor, right? I mean, we're, we're either reaffirming those things or we're now trying to fight to, to sway or change that perception. So these things do matter. I think too, as you were talking about branding, you didn't talk about the color palette and, you know, the font style or things like that. You talked a lot about impression and making sure that, you know, the quality that you put into or the thought that someone puts into their product or service, the branding, the imagery, all of those things support and match that. Can you talk more about just branding at a high level in a sense of, um, the impression we want to make whenever we're creating things that can let people know more about us or our company before we get a chance to actually talk to them. Sure. So, so think of your, your logo. Think of your visual identity as your ambassador. Um, and that's what happens a lot of times. You'll give somebody a business card and they'll pass it on to a friend and they'll connect you. Um, or somebody to whom you get introduced will visit your website. You may be a great salesperson. You may be a phenomenal real estate investor. You may put together great syndicated deals. But at the end of the day, it's not every time that you get to talk to your potential investor or a potential seller or potential lead the first time. The first time they connect with your brand, your company, maybe online or by hearing it from another person. And so it's hypercritical that when they do so, when you're not the first person talking to them, the message you're communicating is strong. And, and so things like color and the fonts you use and the voice that you use in your written communications, whether it's on your website or social media, those matter because at the end of the day, you want to project a consistent image. You know, imagine if you had two partners in a business, one of whom spoke 
uh, in very funny, irreverent tones that was completely out of place in the real estate industry. And the other spoke in perfectly fine human terms, you know, had a sense of humor, but, but really focused on the core business at hand. Clients would be very confused if they heard those two different people speaking at the same conversation, because at the end of the day, uh, it's projecting a, a confusing image about the business. So when you create inconsistent visual identities, that's really what happens. What happens is that people are confused by whether this is in fact your business. And if it's your business, why you have an identity that looks one way on social networks and another identity that looks differently on your website. Um, so all of those things matter because the font, as an example, fonts communicate some type of emotional reaction in people that see them. So, so there's a reason why logos will often use different fonts. There's a reason why designers don't particularly like using certain kinds of fonts like Comic Sans because they're not professional. They don't look particularly good. They don't reflect a strong um, image for a brand. And so the fonts you pick, the sizes of fonts that you use all relate to your audience because if at the end of the day, your audience is people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, you're not going to want to use tiny font that's going to be readable just by 14 and 16 year olds because they're going to get frustrated. They're going to believe that you don't understand them. And so the moment they start a conversation with you, they already have this preconceived notion that you don't understand them and you don't understand what, what moves them and what's difficult for them. And, and that puts you at a disadvantage as a business owner because you've created friction where you could have eliminated it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really great insight about understanding how we can eliminate friction and just create kind of an, an easy dialogue or an easy platform to demonstrate that understanding of who our customers are. You know, as you were talking, you, you mentioned kind of that example of two owners that have maybe different voices or different styles and trying to understand exactly what the tone is of the organization. And you talked about really the consistency across different platforms. And I think that's something people don't really think that much about. You know, they, they may have a blog or, you know, whatever content they have on their website, but their social media might be completely different from that. Um, they might have an email newsletter that's, you know, completely different from that, or maybe it's a little different tone. And just making sure that the brand is kind of showing up in a way that's consistent across the board, um, that will allow you to really bring people into your universe and your world and create that experience. And I think ultimately what you're saying is the branding is more about, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the branding is more about the experience you want someone to take away when they experience when they look at and, and, you know, listen to your message and, and enter into your universe. And it's less about what you get to say to them when you pick up the phone and, and talk to them about your, your, your product or your service. It's a pretty good way to put it. I mean, if you think about what's most important about your brand. So, so branding is about visual design. Your brand is everything, every touch point with, with people with whom you connect. What's most important about your brand isn't what you say. What's most important about your brand is what people think about your brand. In other words, you tell them you're the best real estate investor. You can tell them that you've had great success. But if they don't believe it, if they don't think it, that's not your brand. And the reason, let me give you a practical reason why this is so important, because people are, are some people are great salespeople. They could walk into a meeting and convince somebody to invest $50,000, $100,000 in a real estate deal uh, and, and tell them it's a great deal. Here's my track record. And, and they will think it's a great meeting and that investor is going to send them the funds the next day. But here, here's the reality. As humans, we have different cognitive biases. And, and one of those is, is called the action paralysis principle. We commonly second guess our own behavior especially if we're not sure how this decision is going to impact us or our families, our friends. And, and with investors and investments, investors who are less experienced tend to second guess a lot of those kinds of decisions. So here's what happens practically. You're a great salesperson. You had a phenomenal meeting. You made a huge pitch for this deal, real estate deal that you're, and you're looking for limited partners and the person was eager and you walked away they're going to look online. They're going to find your website. They're going to look at your website and they're going to say, okay, I want to know, know, know more about this person. I want to see what they're doing on Twitter if they're active there. I want to see what their website looks like. I want to see if there are any stories about them. What are they going to find? 
if if you've taken care to think through your visual identity, if you and, and again, it doesn't have to be expensive. This isn't about spending fifty thousand dollars to create a strong visual identity. This is making a smart initial investment to create a strong one. If they find a unique visual identity, something that matches the pitches you're making in these meetings, it's going to reinforce their decision. But if what they're finding is clip art and generic templates, the action paralysis principle, they're already second guessing their behavior. They're going to think, yeah, that doesn't look especially good. It's like if we go to a restaurant and, and the restaurant looks like a dump, you know, we're going to wonder, is this really a place that I want to eat? And you know what? Sometimes those places look like a dump are phenomenal. But just think about your gut reaction when you see it initially. Unless you know something special about them, your gut reaction is always going to dominate it. That's what happens with visual identity. It's what happens when you underinvest in good design in the beginning. It tends to hold you back and it undermines the things that you do to try to grow your business. No, listen, I, I love the analogy and the, the perspective you gave just because as investors, in particular for those of us who, who are real estate investors or really any entrepreneur, ultimately we have to understand the things that we subconsciously are doing to to um, to slow down sales or to slow down conversions. And this may be one of those things where if you haven't sat and actually thought about your business and the branding, again, I know it sounds fun and creative and maybe it's not the brass tacks of just underwriting a deal and getting under contract and throwing it out there. But these things do make a difference when it comes to talking to investors and understanding what people are looking for because they're going to look at your information. And in a world right now where many folks can't meet face-to-face -face or you know more hesitant to meet face-to-face, -face, your online presence is really important because that's all some people may be able to get um, for the foreseeable future. So having that digital presence in particular is really key for someone who, you know, starting out, they're listening to us talk and they're like, man, okay, I, I probably should do something about this. What's the first step, right? Because I know it's not just go get a new logo. So what's the first step to actually either reimagine or to create a stronger digital identity or to revamp your branding? So we've got a couple of great articles at the CrowdSpring blog. We, we do a lot of long-form content, so 3,000 to 20,000 words we, we, we share it for free. Uh, we have two great guides that answer that question. One is um, our 2021 guide to rebranding, and this is um, – you know, many thousands of words focusing on existing businesses and the challenges they face creating a strong visual brand and how they can go about improving it, giving themselves a competitive advantage. And it goes through all the steps, building a strategy and what's important. And then the second guide, and I'll share these with you in the show notes so you can share with listeners. But if people go to crowdspring.com slash blog, um, you'll see um, across all of our categories, a lot of this content. The second one is how to how to brand, how to create a strong visual brand. And, and there are two good guides on this. One is our guide to brand identity. It's 21,000 words and it covers everything. Fonts, colors, voice, brand guidelines. Uh, it's probably the most authoritative guide online on this topic. And the other one is a shorter guide. It's about 6,000 words uh, about branding. And it, it's, a, it's a condensed version that focuses on, on some of the things you need to do. If you're an established business, so, so you know, listeners who are new have, have one advantage in the sense that they're starting off from a blank slate. So they can choose to make the right, smart, affordable investments in their visual identity today. If you're running a business and, and part of your distress, part of the friction is you feel like you're not growing it enough and you recognize your visual brand could be part of the problem. Uh, one good place to start is something called a SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, and we talk about that in our branding guides. And SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And there are a series of questions that you ask yourself, your employees, your investors, your partners, um, and it's a way to try to understand your existing brand. It involves trying to see how do people think about you right now? What do they what do they think when they see your website, when they see your marketing materials? And then taking that and revamping it into something better. And the thing is, 
most successful companies rebrand. And the reason they do that is to stay relevant. So if you're still pitching real estate deals like you did 20 years ago, or like people did 20 years ago, you may not be as relevant today. You may not understand today's investors nearly as well. Investors have shifted just as their culture has shifted. I mean, just think about what happened in 2020 with, with the pandemic, with the economy and people struggling. And so, so part of the reason even the most successful companies in the world rebrand and agencies is they want to stay relevant. They want to stay fresh. They want to show people visually that they are aware that times are changing, that they're ready for those changes. And so just last week, we saw Burger King rebrand, one of the biggest businesses in, in the fast food restaurant space. So this is a good opportunity, especially the start of the year, to take a look and say, well, what can I do to improve my visual design so that it helps me connect with more investors, so that it helps me promote my real estate deals, so that it gives me more credibility as opposed to hurting me? creating friction with my ability to sell these deals or undermining my credibility when I talk to somebody and then they look at my website or they look at my marketing materials. No, I love that. And listen, your point about staying relevant and making sure that all of our materials, they're supporting our efforts. They're helping us to essentially be our voice or, you know, going back to your quote earlier, the images that people see they leave a positive impression to lead people to the next step as opposed to making people pause and say, wait a minute, this, this doesn't seem right. Or, you know, I don't know if I really want to do business with, uh, with this kind of company based on what I'm seeing visually. So just making sure these things are, are helping you and supporting you. And I would say too, like a lot of people right now, maybe they have none of this stuff. Maybe they're a great real estate investor, or broker, or whatever. They don't even have a website or they don't have a presence that's been updated. What would you say to someone who really hasn't invested any time or energy into kind of their, their visual identity or their, their online presence up to this point? So, so the SWOT analysis gives you a chance to think through what's important. What are your opportunities? Listen, there's no universal truth for this. So it may be that you can be a phenomenally great real estate investor without worrying about your visual identity. There are companies, Berkshire Hathaway doesn't invest a lot of money on office space on great visual design and they're extremely successful. But that's unusual. Those are outliers. And, and the way that we tend to judge each other's credibility is, is very different and actually very common. So if you have existing investors and you never have to look for new people and those investors love what you do and continue to invest, then Maybe you don't need a, a great logo. Maybe you don't need a strong website. You're doing perfectly well. That's the 1% of the top 1% of real estate investors. The other 99.99% are constantly having to look at uh, the broader market. They need more limited partners. They need to find better deal syndication. If they've got a deal, they need to create strong branding for the real estate properties they're buying or trying to turn over. That's the reality for the majority of businesses. and and there, you can get a huge competitive advantage by taking a look and saying, what can I do to create a more credible presence online? So if you're starting with nothing, it could be about doing something simple. It doesn't have to be, you know, hundreds of pages online, but, you know, what are your limited partners interested in when they look you up online? They want to see the deals that you've done before. They want to see the other limited partners, ideally, who've worked with you, or at least the monetary value of the deals. They want to see the areas and the kinds of properties you've done before. Maybe they want to see some content. So if you've, if you've written some good content around how to do some of these deals or different ways to syndicate deals or, or different traps and, and benefits of certain kinds of real estate property, great place to put it is on your blog because they could see you have expertise in this area. So, so if all your content is aggregated all over the place, See if you could pull it in together a little better, even if it's just length. Because the reality is that people look online to research. They look online to double check their initial impressions. And they look online for both confirming and disconfirming factors around people they meet. That's, that's just how we, we do. When we start looking for a new product, we're just as likely to go to Google or Amazon to look for reviews of how other people like that product before we even think about buying that product. And so people are inquisitive. And if you give them a strong visual identity, if you give them 
no reason to doubt that you are knowledgeable and strong, then then you're going to give yourself an advantage. Because that that's you the initial conversation where we started. You know the 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 emotional reaction, the experience. A logo at its basic, you know, what happens when you see another brand's logo, a company's logo? Two things happen. First, there's a chemical reaction in your brain. There's a reaction to that logo if you know what the brand is. So if it's an Apple logo and you like Apple products, there's a positive reaction in your brain and you get excited. If you hate Apple products and you see an Apple logo, there's a negative, not a particularly positive reaction in your brain. The second thing that happens is, you have a certain expectation about that company, about that company's products or services. So that if it's a brand that you recognize and know, you expect their services are going to be high quality and good. And if it's a brand that you don't know, you just don't have that reaction. So if you, if you don't have a strong visual identity, people can't react to anything you do. They don't know you. If you build a strong visual identity and people know about it, then you're improving the reaction to that. And you're giving yourself a small advantage when you communicate with them. So th that's really why the overall experience, and that's why I mentioned earlier, design is important, so is the product or service that you sell. You can't invest time in one without investing time in the other. No, I appreciate that guidance. And I'll, and I'll say too, as you were talking, you know, we've talked a lot about brand from a company standpoint, but if you are an investor or you have any kind of product, um, you know, it's just as important for those things. Let's say you are repositioning an apartment complex. Well, the renters don't care about the owners, right? They care about the apartment and the apartment community that they're planning on living in. So what's the branding for that apartment community? What does it look like? What does the naming look like? What do the logos look like? You know, what kind of emotional response is that going to elicit? And I think we also need to think about not so much just our overarching company, but the products and the services that we're offering out there to consumers, because ultimately, they're the ones who have to make those decisions about what they're going to buy or where they're going to rent. And if we're not able to demonstrate why our communities or our products or services uh, can, can deliver and provide uh, a better visual identity for them to make that decision quickly, or at least, you know, reconfirming things with their eyes, it's going to be another challenge for us to to face, especially again, if people can't physically come out and see the properties, many of them are just looking online. So that's really the only, the only avenue you have and having a logo, having a name for a property, having, you know, beautiful pictures and things like that, that's just going to make you stand out above and beyond a property that is at one, two, three main street and just has some basic information about the, uh, the apartment. Absolutely. And, and, and the significant thing here and is the reason we started CrowdSpring in the first place is it's no longer, cost is no longer a barrier. It used to be cost was a barrier. You just had no choice. You could spend $10,000 or, or not have anything useful. Cost is no longer a barrier. So there's no reason why every entrepreneur, business owner, whether you're investing in real estate, buying real estate, uh, turning over, it doesn't matter. You should make a, a modest investment in design when you start your business. You know, good design is good business. And if you're struggling to grow your business, among the other things that you should review, certainly what you're doing and what's failing, but design should be part of that review. How can you improve your credibility um, with better design? Yeah, good design is good business. I love that. Ross, we're going to move on to our bullseye round. You ready? Ready. Give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. So back in 2009, uh, we were migrating uh, our site from one uh, computer language to another. And we had all sorts of points of failure. We, we planned on a three hour outage and we had a four day outage. And uh, this was tough. I was actually in Germany at the time at a conference in the middle of this. And I thought we were done. You know, a business that can't, can't stay up, an online business uh, has a lot of problems. Uh, and so um, I, I was really frustrated, but I started hearing from clients and creatives in our community who said, listen, we get it. This is the reality of business. Sometimes it happens. You know, you've built a lot of credibility and, and we trust you and we know you're going to get over that. And, and, and it reinforced for me that the incredible importance of, of from day one starting to build credibility. It's like a bank. You, you can bank your credibility and it gives you a chance sometimes to make mistakes because we're all human. 
we make mistakes and, and we made a number of mistakes during that conversion. We ultimately uh, put up the new site and were successful and we were embarrassed. We, we wrote all our clients said, you know, we, we made a mistake, but, but that failure taught me about the importance of every day investing in building that credibility because ultimately uh, none of us are infallible. We're all going to get to a point where we do something that we regret or we do something wrong. And if we've created credibility, if we've created trust with clients, um, it doesn't mean they're naturally going to forgive us because, listen, credibility takes a long time to build, but seconds to destroy in, in a general context. But but it does mean that if a company that fails to build it isn't going to have much when, when something happens. So, so that was a big lesson for us. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. So I use lots of small tools to, to make me efficient. I mean, one tool that we use in our business that I think works really well and would work for most businesses is a very simple project management tool uh, from a company called Basecamp and the tool is called Basecamp. It's, it's not one of these, you know, very complicated traditional like Microsoft project management tools with lots of bells and whistles. We use it for asynchronous communication. The thing that I think drives a lot of companies nuts and slows down innovation, whether you're a small company or a big company, is uh, meetings, conversations where nothing happens. So we tend to spend 90% of our time asynchronously, written feedback back and forth, and, and Basecamp is great for us. And then when we actually have to meet, We've done 90% of the work, so we just have to focus on the last 10%. It saves us a tremendous amount of time. It saves us from having to stay in meetings all day long, um, and, and it really creates a better outcome. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. So there's a, there's a great book uh, about business that's not about business. It's called Turn the Ship Around. Uh, one of my favorite books, because it was surprising. It's a book written by a former uh, nuclear submarine uh, officer who, who, who led the submarine. The, this was the worst performing submarine in the Navy. Uh, it was terrible. And, and part of what he did when he came into the, uh, to the submarine is completely changed the way um, leadership work. So in a typical submarine, you've got commanders giving orders up and down. He saw this and said, you know what, this isn't working for us. So he found a way to empower his crew rather than to listen for decisions and not be accountable for them to actually start making decisions. And I know it sounds weird in a nuclear submarine, but, but in this case, it, it worked out so well because by empowering his crew to make those decisions, they became accountable. They understood their decisions had an impact where before they just assumed somebody else would make them and figure out what the impact would be. Turned this submarine into the most best performing submarine in the fleet. People serving under him became commanders of lots of other uh, ships and submarines. And, and as soon as I read this book, I said, you know, this is amazing. This is about, you know, a nuclear submarine, but, but the thing I need to do in the morning, and I did this in the morning, is completely change how I relate to my team. And so I went, uh, went to the office uh, the next morning. We, we still had an office and our team is always in the distributed, but some people were at the office. And I said, listen, I read this great book. I want you all to read it because I think we can do much better in the way we connect with each other. And you know, the managers could do much better and people they work with. So turn the ship around. Ph phenomenal book about business that's not about business. Give me, a, give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. <laughs> exercise. Uh, it, it's incredibly important for me. So I, um, I row um, four days a week. Uh, Monday is an off day for me for exercise. I row four days a week uh, in, at home and I ride a bike about 150 to 200 miles uh, a week as well. And so, so for me, that habit really gives me a chance to get away from my business. Every business owner listening to your show knows it's impossible to get away from thinking about your business. It's always in your head. And so there are very few things that you can do where you can just focus on the thing you're doing. So these are things I enjoy. Um, I can spend 30 minutes on the rower, I can spend a couple hours on the bike, um, and it gives me a chance to, if I'm riding outdoors, enjoy nature, think about things other than work, but also, you know, it reinforces the importance of physical health because you can't focus unless you're emotionally and physically um, at your best. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting out? How to measure success. Uh, so I think we all start out by thinking success is tied to 
a dollar sign. In other words, most people assume that the more money you have, the more successful you are. And as you get older, as you as you pay attention more, what you learn is that more money doesn't equal happiness. That at a certain level, you know, in, in general, $75,000, this seems to be a good point, over $75,000, people are not significantly more happy than if you're earning at that level. And so most people don't really ask themselves, what do I believe success is? They just kind of assume that success is monetary. And I made that decision, you know, for me, that conversation happened maybe in my 30s. I wish it happened in my 20s, because uh, I think it's so important to know what it is. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with wanting to become wealthy, with providing for your family, with enjoying a perfectly fine life. But at the end of the day, that's not what makes every single person happy. And the sooner you know that, the sooner you can redefine what success is for you and focus your energies on the things that make you happy. What are you curious about right now? Everything. Uh, so, so at the moment, I've been reading. You know, listen, we've got lots of things going on in the in the country that are that are confusing. So. Um, I've been reading uh, quite a lot, and I, and I read a lot on a lot of topics, but for the past few weeks, I've been focusing on, on um, racism and white supremacy. These are, these are tough issues. Um, they're distressing issues. So I just finished a great book called Me and White Supremacy, um, and I'm reading a book called uh, White Fragility right now. Um, for, for me, you know, part, part of the challenge is understanding racism, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, 80 years old, 20 years old these are hard concepts and i think one of the one of the challenges has been to try to understand how how words that that even perfectly fine people think are innocuous can be trigger words can be challenging words can, can themselves promote uh, behavior that that ultimately disenfranchises people, puts them down. So for me, it's a, it's an interesting topic because, listen, I assume I know very little about most topics, and and this one, I know even less simply because while I could sympathize with some people, I can't always empathize with everyone because I don't know what it's like to walk in their shoes. So I can listen to the stories, but so I'm forcing myself to just become better educated because I want to make sure that, you know. Media talks about things at a very peripheral context. Um, and so there are some people that do a great job, but but I wanna make sure I listen to those people. I wanna make sure that I understand the, the depth of these conversations because they're they're happening, whether we like it or not, we cannot ignore them. Yeah, there's certainly a lot going on and uh, those sound like some great books to check out. So we'll make sure we link to, to those in the show notes as well. And on a little bit of a lighter note, you know, I know you're in the Chicago area. I spent eight years in Chicago as well. Uh, so I'm going to let you pick whether you want to go Highland Park or Chicago, but give me the best place to grab a bite in the city. Best place to grab a bite in the city. Um, hmm. See, it always stomps Chicago. So, right? yeah, I mean, th th there are so many great restaurants. I mean, if you like pizza, there's, you know, Gino Z's, there's Lou Malnati's. There, there's so many great places. I guess it really depends on, on what you like. Um, I don't have I don't have a single favorite. I like different kinds of food. So so at the end of the day, I mean, listen, if if uh, if it's pizza, Malnati's is a great choice. Gino's East is a great choice. It's you know one, one of my favorites. Um, but as far as other kinds of food, Chicago is one of these cities that that like New York and other big cities has so much great food so many great restaurants it's almost hard to go wrong yeah a lot of great options there it's the thing i miss most about the city is just uh the the wide variety of food options so hopefully uh things clear up and i'm able to get back there soon and uh, maybe we can catch up and grab a drink or something like that ross i i really enjoyed our conversation you know um i know a lot of folks don't necessarily think about branding uh when it comes to their business but i love the way you just broke down that it's not so much about just you know, the logos and color palettes. It's really about, you know, removing the obstacles from potential consumers or investors and letting them get to know about us, our business, our products, our services, and making sure that we can build a connection that they see us as professional uh, partners in whatever it is that we're trying to do with our business. I just really like the way you you presented that, that stat you gave with, you know, 60,000, you know, the, the images 
uh, being able to move 60,000 times faster than the words. I think that's just a powerful insight that all of us can recognize and say, man, maybe I should invest a little bit more time and energy into the visual identity of my company, my products, my services. Uh, for folks who want to learn more about you, we've talked about Crawl Spring. We've talked a little bit about, you know, some of the, the guides that you have on your website. What is the best way for them to reach out? And maybe you can give the, the website for Crowd Spring as well. Sure. So crowdspring.com, C-R-O-W-D-S-P-R-I-N-G. Our blog is crowdspring.com slash blog. Um, I've got a personal blog, rosskimbarovsky.com, um, mostly my speaking and the books that I've read uh, in the past bunch of years. Uh, Twitter, at Ross Kimbarovsky, at CrowdSpring. Those are going to be the best ways to connect. Ross Kimbarovsky and LinkedIn. Ross, really appreciate you coming with us today on Target Market Insights, the multifamily marketing show. We hope to see you and talk to you again soon. Enjoyed our conversation, John.